questions. I do have larger questions I want to pose to the panel, but I actually thought that it maybe would be useful if the filmmakers could speak first a little bit about the process. Uh, so I was uh, going to ask you just sort of gently first, uh, you know, what your motivation behind the film was and perhaps what you think the arguments are of the film or that you're making with the film and perhaps um, answering that will be uh, easier if you maybe uh, uh, talk about how you chose the people you interviewed uh, and sort of what the process was. I know it's been a really long time since 2007, right? And of course, some of those people aren't even alive anymore, right? So there's uh, uh, also um, this sort of this type of issue of process in the years that go by and then it finally um, coming out and how perhaps then the motivation changed throughout or the arguments also changed throughout. Do you wanna um, well, we started the film when we were getting to know Patrick O'Connell um, and we found out about his involvement in the Red Ribbon Project. Um, I was 21 at that point <coughs> and I had never realized that the Red Ribbon Project was a piece of art. I had known the symbol, clearly everybody knows the symbol, but it had never occurred to me the origins of it. And, um, is it possible to get a water. thing of water? Oh yes, okay. Um, Thank you. And so knowing that, and I viewed myself as a very aware young adult. My mom had uh, shown me when I was probably 11 and the band played on, I mean. So I was somebody who was probably more aware than a lot of people I felt my age, and so I knew there was a gap there. And then talking to Patrick and doing research, we were realized there was a story, so Rebecca and I talked about collaborating on the film. And we went to Patrick and we wanted to make a film about him. And Patrick said, no, <laughs> this is not my story, this is many people's story. And he gave us a list of names. Um, That's no, the rabbit hole. With no, no contact information. No. That was the test. <laughs> Find it yourselves. Um, and so from that list of names, we went after everyone he told us about. And Rebecca was the one who did all the interviews on the film. Um, I'm much more of an outgoing person than I was at the age of 21. And she was much more the one who would go talk to the people we were interviewing. Almost every person we interviewed, she had at least two uh, times of meeting them beforehand, talking to them about the project. Some it was many more times than it was men months of pursuing. Um, and then from there, every person we interviewed, we would ask them very open-ended questions. What artists were important to you? What things do we need to find in this story? You can so, see it in the film, like when John response about Karen Finley's piece. Mm -hmm. We asked everybody. Yeah, it wasn't we didn't ask him about black sheep. We asked, asked him, him what art piece matters. We went into it with a very clear decision that you are not to go into it with any answers, only questions. Mm -hmm. Which is part of the reason the film took much longer <laughs> than a lot of documentaries because we believe in the very old school theory of a documentary is you don't go in knowing the story. You go in having some concepts of the story but you let the documentary carry you where it's supposed to carry you which makes it a much longer form process because then once you have everything, you have to make the story. Um, so from there, we interviewed every artist we could get in touch with. Of course, there's some people who we just simply were not able to get in touch with or were not willing to be interviewed. I mean, not everybody wants to be interviewed for a documentary. Um, and that's pretty much the process of how it grew to, until a point where we were like, okay, We've been interviewing people for, I think we did three years of yeah. collecting interviews, and at that we were like, there just has to be a stopping point. Yeah, stop. Because the story could go on. I mean, there's so many important So why these in people it. is because these people, it's their story and they picked each other and they are all very connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Does that answer? Yes, all absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I also. It just occurred to me, and of course, while I was watching the film, I was thinking about it too. How, of course, you started it such a long time ago, but then also something like uh, How to Survive a Plague came up, right? And there is obviously some overlap, but your film has a lot more emphasis on the production of art, right? Mm -hmm. So, did the release of that film also sort of change? It did it slightly. Did. We it had did a, slightly, yeah. We, we had put in more because at that point, we started making our film before the act up film and before How to Survive a Plague. Mm -hmm. 
And we were, we were in a hard place of there are so many young people that don't even understand the history. So there was a larger section of the protesting to, to help understand what the dynamics were there and it actually helped us be able to do more of what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We were really, really like, thank you. Take that out, now we can add in, you know, out of the many hours we can we can use them better for what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We were also lucky enough to see how to survive a play between one of our rough cuts and our final cut. So we tried not to do too much overlap of even the activist footage that's mm -hmm. in the film is different activist footage than you see in How to Survive a Play. Just because I was able to be like, oh, they use that shot. From the Take same source. Out. Their yeah, source is our source. source. So he, James Wednesday had given both of us. Theirs was remastered. Beautifully. Uh, beautifully. I am so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> they had uh, the Lucas Studios remastered. We didn't have the money for that. Mm -hmm. But we also didn't want to overlap. Sure, sure. Uh, because we had James Wednesday filmed everything. So. Thanks. Um, so uh, my next question is actually also for the curators <laughs> on the uh, panel. And that, of course, what's really interesting about this film, and I think depending, of course, uh, also on the audience, and if you want to comment also on sort of how you were thinking about your audience, which with a documentary film is very different than, for example, uh, you know, um, show uh, at the museum. But of course, what's really interesting in this film is this tension between art for the museum versus art on the street that's worn on t-shirts, that's, you know, performative, that's ephemeral, that's temporal, that has all these other aspects uh, that sort of make it difficult to be institutionalized. But of course, um, as you know, you know, there was also in, in that time period, and Jonathan Katz, of course, has written on this and has a, this fabulous uh, arts uh, uh, show that's uh, traveling right now. Where is it right now? Tacoma. Tacoma, still, so, okay. And then it's going? Atlanta, New York, and Chicago. Okay, yeah, so this uh, show, and maybe you want to say something about it really quickly for just a moment, if you don't sure. mind. Sure, I mean, it's just a show that, that um, argues that AIDS has been the great motor for the development of American culture over the last 25 years, but it, as with everything else related to AIDS, we repress that. And so it tries to show how many of the currents of the contemporary art world were born out of the very particular social and historical conditions early in the yeah, but and also the other argument that it is making, at least from my impression, I haven't seen the show yet, is that there's both the, in in the art world both this tendency, as on, not just in the art world, but in the in terms of art making during the time, this very obvious message. You know, you can read it, you can read it on the shirt. You do, you make a statement. The red ribbon becomes a kind of statement at the same time as you have very coded sort of subdued art forms that fit nice, more nicely into the gallery system, right? That do not speak as loudly about the issues. And one of the amazing things, of course, was this great show, Let the Record Show. And I was wondering, uh, you know, if you want to comment on sort of this discrepancy between the street and the museum on one hand, and also, of course, naming your documentary or naming this documentary, Let the Record Show, referencing actually a show at the new museum, which was really important, of course, facing the street, so actually being exactly at this intersection between street and museum, which is so, you know, um, important for your film. And if the curators want to sort of comment on your own experiences of curating these shows and thinking about this type of problem. So, <laughs> whoever wants to go first. <laughs> um, well, oh, thank you. The title. <laughs> I'll, I'll comment on the title. The title is, of course, after that piece. Um, and also, we felt like it was such a powerful statement when we started the film. Like we said, it was before How to Survive a Plague, and the ACT UP film at that point was still just in the archive format. Um, so it was kind of like there is a record that needs to be shown. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we wanted to do with the title. This is missing from our history. This is such an important, important piece of our history. It's like was just said, it changed, I think, everything in our culture without people realizing it. Having been in art school at the time, I saw so many of the students I was in school with referencing artists from this time period without realizing they're referencing her it's from this time period. So it's really wanting to say, this is our record of this time period. We had a working title, which we really like to call a visual activist project. Sometimes we feel like we should have stuck with that. But 
you know, say la vie, you have to pick a title. I think at the time that's covered in the film, uh, many of the artists wouldn't separate, would, in, would not separate the, their, their practice in terms of this is so-called for the street and, and this is what's going to happen in the museum because they were overlapping in their personal life constantly. So it's what the, uh, the, the, uh, the art world was itself willing to absorb, I think. I mean, I'm sorry, I have really actually don't, I, starting with that film, I hadn't really spoken <laughs> publicly for over a decade. So um, it's very, it, oddly enough, it's not just an academic exercise for me, it's very personal and it's very painful to recall that period in my own life and in my friends' lives. So uh, it's just, you know, I, I think that the, the the, the impetus was to talk about our lives. And for many, and surprisingly, as Penny said the other night, I just refused to die. This was going to be the last time I was talking about my life. And um, it's, uh, it, it's weird to be sitting here this way to do it instead of uh, just doing it, just to be talking about it. But I don't think there was that great a difference. I mean, it's more obvious in someone like Frank Moore's work, okay? I mean, as a, the, the practices that you're, you're referencing and that he was a member of the Artist Caucus, he was de definitely involved in many of our street, so-called street projects, but um, his canvases covering that period and, his, and afterwards are about that about this work and obviously um, the paintings didn't have a difficult time reaching the museum walls so I don't I mean I actually I mean it's interesting to think that way I just think that everyone was involved in both you know but it's, it's, it, it is interesting isn't it that there were a whole range of artists who produced work that was definitely not for the street. People like uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, for example, whose work was often in the street, but but was not sponsored by activist movements, but sponsored by museums and galleries. Right. Right. And then. Well, yes. I mean, we worked um, with group material. Right. Um, somehow, as a collective <laughs> that. Um, is often forgotten that uh, Felix was in, and uh, the t the AIDS timeline, et cetera. We did a big project with them, and uh, yes, that which was, um, I actually, you know, was marketable, was slightly different, but was about much of the same. The content didn't change. I think his personal format sh shifted. Yeah, I think, I think that's true, but it's also, it, wouldn't you agree that there were plenty of works of activist power that the museums would not show? I mean, I remember how difficult it was to get art about AIDS into the museum in the early days, especially if it dealt with politics or blood or, or bodies. Well, it depends on whether you're talking about big museums or art centers, places like Hall Walls or the New Museum or wherever. I mean, I think here at Hall Walls there was, like you say, no division whatsoever. I didn't see any division at all between what was art and what was activism. ACT UP Western New York met at Hall Walls partly because I happened to work here and, well, there, uh, the 700 Main Street, and we had, uh, we had a location that we could offer, but also a lot of the artists I was presenting, a lot of people you see in this film, uh, it, it just made perfect sense. They, it, we, were a, we, we were a space, there wasn't anywhere else in town that, that was really doing that, uh, you know, providing that kind of, of, of space. But, you know, when you talk about things, artists doing work that belonged, uh, you know, that were inside the museum and, and works that were on the street, it's true that the, the exhibitions 
uh, curator at Hallwalls at the time, Charles Wright, was more of a, a you know art on the walls kind of person. So we presented both kinds of work here. So, I, but I mean, there was room for all kinds of things to be done, and there it needed to be it needed to be done. But I think it is the artwork of that era. Activism was there. People like Tim Miller and Richard Elovich, who was in this film, would actually do as performances. Uh, civil disobedience training, not here at Halls, but in New York City. And so that line was completely gone between this is politics and this is art. And we came out of a generation immediately before us that was largely because of feminism adopting the, the strategy that the personal is the political. The performance art that I was most interested in as a curator and as a creator was extremely personal. And the art that was being made was a, partly about the representation of people in the media, which is where a lot of the language for you know, visual aids, I think, came from, the fact that people worked in graphic design and so forth. But also, um, work was very, very personal at that time. And it's sort of like it's the work that got made was it's of its time. It's of its city and of its time. I think there was a shift too. I, I, you know, you have Jerry Tartaglia said in the film, we weren't making art for the <clears throat> fucking art world. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talked to Richard and when we talked to Abram, there was a shift to them of they were not doing it for people of the art world to witness. And they were very angry. And, and Richard said it wasn't <laughs> until they realized that they could reach people. So their motivation was not being artists in museums anymore. It was re the message was what was important to them. So that was a shift for many of the act up. Like Avram, I don't think, by then considered himself an artist, even though he had gone that direction. I think by the time act up was was gaining power, the little bit it had, that to him was only a vehicle for a message. No longer was art the concern. Good. And maybe for many of the artists, Richard Elvich left being an artist to do medical mm -hmm. thing. You know, I think for many of those younger artists, maybe art became quite secondary in the museum context and the gallery context. Well, there's the art world and the fucking art world. I think they're two. <laughs> right. They're two different right. places. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I have, I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up. And this is um, uh, just something that really struck me about your film is that one of the themes, I mean, there are many themes, obviously, the question <coughs> of ritual, mourning, which are all also connected to these uh, practices and performance and uh, in demonstrations. But one of the things that really struck me, I guess, watching it as maybe a, not um, a citizen of the United States and as someone, you know, given also sort of the moment of our time right now and um, the Black Lives Matter movement and all of these sort of questioning the boundaries of what it means to be citizen in one place or another. Of course, this film is, as you said, and as I expected, very much centered around the world of New York, right? And who was you know, involved in, in those types of spaces. But one of the things that uh, is interesting to me is that on one side you have the, the very uh, conservative side talking about good morality being good medicine, so the cardinal like having these really horrifying kind of, uh, uh, you know, making these arguments about uh, health and uh, uh, actions. But on the other hand, um, the whole discourse around AIDS being often centered around the question of American identity and American citizenship. And of course you have uh, one really important, and I, I really love this, uh, um, and I'm trying to find his name. Um, one intervention, Roger McFarlane, who talks about this question of the rich, white, middle class, who's sort of taken up this problem, which of course also in many ways I equate with citizenship, with this American citizenship. And so I guess I'm already commenting on this sort of problem, but what is your um, position towards this question of it being um, you know, an American problem or a larger problem, of course, uh, thinking about other spaces in the world that don't have access to medicine, but also sort of how we conceptualize um, the idea of protest in relation to citizenship and asking for care for people, right? 
in, in this type of crisis. So we have another crisis happening right now, and there's a lot of alliance and a lot of uh, similar um, you know, movements in, for example, Black Lives Matter, looking at sort of how to intervene in space through visual material as well, very much also borrowing from these very important traditions, right? So I guess my question is sort of to complicate the idea, the history of AIDS activism under the umbrella of citizenship, sort of thinking about the contemporary context. I hope I'm making sense, I'm sorry. <laughs> I went a little I'm not sure what the question is. I really enjoyed what you were saying. I think okay. it's really interesting. Okay, you're not directly. How would you, the arguments you're trying to make in your film, how do, do they relate to the larger, like beyond the American context, perhaps? Or um, the New York context? Well, we had an interesting discussion. We did, you know, three screenings recently at Leslie Lohman. On the first night, we had a great panel. We had Philip Yenowin and we had uh, Abram Finkelstein. We had Mark Happel, and it became the Patrick, of course, and it became a discussion of kind of our modern times of using things like Facebook and Twitter and these hashtags, Black Lives Matters, as opposed to the art that was being done at this time, and what can we learn and take from those things, and how can we contextualize that to really use these tools in a modern time? I don't think an answer was actually arrived at. <coughs> But it's definitely a debate that is something that we want this to be able to be a tool. We want it to be an educational tool that people can take, use, learn from these artists. One thing that Philip Yenowin, who is such kind of an educator and his knowledge on art education, I think can't be even questioned, is that he said one thing he's noticed is that it has to be text and image. Mm -hmm. And that things like Black Lives Matter, maybe part of it is not having the image attached. That we need to constantly have these texts in image. That it's a combination. So that was one thing that came up. Um, you know, I don't have any answers. We may, we're documentarians, so we just, you know, record and tell the story. But I do think it's something to try to figure out how can we learn from the art that was created and the power of these activist movements to use what they're doing now for whatever the issue may be. Unfortunately, I think there's so many issues right now is one of the problems. There's so many things happening. What is the issue you're picking? You know what I mean? Is it but gun control issue, right yeah. now? How do we use this for that? You know, is it Black Lives Matter? You have to pick your thing and decide how to use those things. And I think if people do study from these mentors, they can take their actions further. They can take, I love how Richard Elovich says, we had you know, 10 people, and we made it look like 100 people. Mm -hmm. They played with so many different visual, different techniques that I think are such powerful tools that we still have at our fingertips, and then finding a way to take that and also make it more personal. Instead of just meeting with people on the internet, writing something and having these internet communities, actually meeting people in person, I think, right. makes a big difference. I think one young man stood up and said during that that he felt like it was too easy, that the internet's too easy. There's no thought really has to go behind it. You write this hashtag and it's out there and you haven't had to sit down in a group and think and talk and strategize and that's something he felt missing. But I don't think there's a simple answer to it, unfortunately. But two, two things pop into my mind recently that use social media but, all, but aren't disseminated through social media related to issue. One was, so the first one was in Cal, in, I guess it was Berkeley, where the where the cops sprayed the protesters with um, uh, pepper spray, and that became like that filtered through the culture through memes, through visual uh, uh, images and treatments of that. Um, and the other one was when um, I can't remember her name, but the woman who was an artist, young African woman, American woman, who climbed the flagpole and took down the flag. Mm -hmm. She became like an icon uh, of other people's art that really, and then and then just the cartoons, say, of Charlie Hebdo and, and the responses to that, uh, to their killing, was also something where artists specifically had visual responses that were then disseminated through social media. So like it can't, it, there isn't really, I can't really think of a strong image, it's more of a hashtag, and then actual actions, like, yeah. uh, go, you know, taking over the, 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 the stage at a Bernie Sanders rally or something. 
but not really yet. No visual image connected to it. Um, and, and where I think it gets complicated is that when you get things online, there's stuff you're already attuned to, alive, you know, towards, and that you've clicked on, you're interested in already. And the problem with that, of course, is that it simply reinforces extant belief <coughs> systems. And the thing about art is that it can often challenge mm -hmm. extant right. belief systems. I remember um, being profoundly educated by a piece called The Lazaretto by Paul Marcus that was in 1980, I can't remember, um, in, at, at PPOW in its first space. And it was a, it, it's very hard to describe a work of art, but it was a series of tunnels made out of butcher paper in which women with AIDS wrote um, in magic marker various statements. Um, and some of them were like, I've made peace with my own death, but who's going to take care of my children, things like that. Very, very powerful. And I remember it as, as, as revelatory in part because up till that point, I was young, I was stupid, I hadn't thought about women with AIDS, right? It made me do that. And that kind of experience, I think, is lost on the net. I think it's hard to connect on the internet, and I also think on the street. You know, when you see them doing the bloody hands, mm -hmm. and you're walking in your environment, it's so different than sitting on your laptop and sharing it. It just feels different to me to see it in your environment is, is, is almost a little shocking, almost a little scary. I think if people were taking these arts on, if Black Lives Matter was plastered everywhere, we plastered everywhere, I think people would talk more about it just among each other and, and, and you'd have more dialogue, I think, than just like-minded people like you're saying, going, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Um, I have a question, kind of not about the internet, but Jonathan's comment about the artwork um, that was specifically about women with AIDS that made you rethink um, that. And I have a question for the filmmakers about the narrative that you're presenting. Um, so, for example, the Stop the Church demonstration that you show, that wasn't just a demonstration with ACT UP, it was also with WAM. And I felt that the representation of women's groups specifically were kind of underrepresented in the film. And I also had a question about the omission of people of color in the film. Well, there's no omission of anything in the film. It's a specific story we told. So we, like we said, we went to everyone. Who would you like us to interview? This is such a huge story that needs, this is an hour and a half, and this is a part of history that needs tens and tens of hours of people watching films about it. It's just starting to be realized and spoken. So it wasn't really a mission. It was making choices, making choices of what things to focus on in the film and which art projects. And it just had to do with the artists we spoke to. It really only had to do with which artists came up and who we interviewed and who they brought us to and who we spoke to. And we could have kept going and kept interviewing to make it more diverse. I suppose if that had been our point, but our point wasn't about that. It was about telling this personal story. It wasn't about choosing based on that, it was yeah, choosing we, based on the pieces, pieces they told us about. And the, the art really let us, not any agendas of anything. And I we mean, dovetailed, we dovetailed, you know, uh, silence equals death with the ribbon. So if you look, there's it's kind of the beginning and the end of, of this, this period and these artists that we were doing. And if Abram were black, it would be black Abram telling that story, but Abram was white. And I think Roger kind of shows a lot of the people that were able to, maybe economically, maybe because of turmoils within their own community, there was a, a strong white voice artistically going on in New York City at that time. It doesn't mean there weren't other voices, but to just throw in somebody because of, of gender or color is, is, to me, a larger disservice. And it's kind of placating to the masses to, to not have to answer that. It, it was simply chosen by the projects by who the artist told, and it's it's a very circular story of this group. Mm -hmm. And there's so many groups in New York, like we didn't delve into other areas of New York City. I mean, it's a, this is the the tip of, of art. Who this knows is, if we had started with somebody else, it might have been a different circle that it led us to, but it was really who each person led us to, it was a very organic process. Okay. But like the Stop the Church demonstration, I mean, you specifically named that. Right, but there's no reference to Wham. 
we don't even name it. We just have it in there as a sample of what's happening. I mean, it's not a project that's talked about in the film. It was more to show the activism that was happening at that right, time. Right, my point is just that you, you construct a very specific narrative of that activism, right? We show it because they also used a very, we're, it was all about the visuals. So our film is about art. So it was about the use of using coffins and bodies in that is the reason we chose to show that movement because it was such a visual demonstration. Um, it didn't have to do with admitting anyone. I mean, it's not, we didn't go into really any ACT UP demonstrations or groups affiliated with it because it's not an ACT. There was How to Survive a Plague, there are other ACT UP films going on. So really the only projects we went into were Silence Equals Death and the Grand Fury projects because they were the artists affiliated group with it. It was about the art for us. There was a question over there. Uh, yeah, you were you were getting onto the topic of sort of the local versus the international earlier, and um, it's kind of interesting because now in the age of social media, the international is sort of an immediate uh, context. Uh, but you know, this film, the resonance for me in this film is very, very personal and very local. And there, you know, there's a remark near the end of the film uh, about wanting uh, you know, the younger generation to understand what New York was like before the, this plague. It, it, meaning that there was this closely knit community of artists and uh, performers and individuals uh, that responded for a time in their way. Uh, and, in, and in a context where for a long time they were not getting you know, today that kind of activism would spread more widely, more quickly, and uh, the persistence of that um, action at that time seemed to be very local and very personal, clearly, to everyone involved, and that seemed to be the heart of it, um, and, you know, reflective of the community that existed at the moment that the crisis began, you know, there was a community there that was able to respond and uh, strong enough to, you know, find a language to deal with it. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, I was a suburban kid in Canada at the time this was happening and, uh, yeah, you'd hear little news stories about, you know, it was sort of, you'd hear the peripheral kind of AIDS news story from New York, but it, uh, it really was a little, little drips of information. Yeah, but did you see time. when we turned off the Empire State Building the next yeah. day? Yeah. yeah. Well, the only other thing I wanted to say was that um, the, thing, the other thing that I really found interesting about the movement captured in the film was that it happened in New York in, in a place where, you know, at least it would garner attention in a large context like that. The politics were, were different, like San Francisco has a very <coughs> different story because in New York, the powers that, that uh, and certainly Patrick should speak more, were, it was a very different situation than what San Francisco was contending with. Uh, so the response was angrier and stronger because there was, the lack of response was much less in New York than in San Francisco. What I like most about the film is what John's talking about, the specificity of this is the arts community of New York. This is a particular section of the arts community of New York City responding to the AIDS crisis. I totally hear what you're saying about the omissions, but <clears throat> you're not trying to make the AIDS film. There can't be but an did, AIDS she film. You did say early on, what, the reason I'm challenging is because you do say like there's a gap in the history, right? And you're trying to fill that gap. And so you are telling a specific story, and I think it is important to just be mindful of the type of story you're telling and who speaks in your film. But that gap can't be filled by a single film. Sure. I mean, this, ha yeah, sure. this is there. I've seen films that focus on uh, healthcare workers in San Francisco, and they're great films. I saw one about AIDS activism in the UK that Hallwell showed many, many years ago that I thought was great. And we, we, all these stories have to be told and they have to be preserved and retold because there are new audiences that didn't live through this period that need to know about it. You only have there so were much many, time. I mean, there were so many stories we wanted to tell in the film too. The, 
it's an hour and a half film. We have enough footage to make probably a 10 hour film. We wanted to talk about the NEA4. I think that's just as important within the story. We didn't. Not enough time probably needs its own film. We gentrification. Wanted gentrification. We have enough for a gentrification. I mean, uh, the needle. The needle, needle problem. Exchange. Richard Elovich spoke so eloquently. I mean, we and it's go on such and on about the different the stories. Exchange. I mean, yeah, it's like, I hope that this history continues to have people highlighting it and making films and being told this is just one film that needs to be part of a continually growing canon. I feel like it's our, my generation's, our generation's Vietnam, and you can't tell the story of Vietnam in a single book or a single movie. Uh, there have to be many, many, many perspectives. Um, and I think that the more specific, the better in, these, uh, in this case. Uh, you know, you were talking about the, people have talked about the internet as, as a thing that's different. But the other thing that I think was very important about that era was you didn't, not only did you not have the internet, you had basically three TV networks. Even Fox News was kind of like, the, not Fox News, Fox uh, Network uh, was new. And so <clears throat> there were two things happening. One was ACT UP was extremely successful at getting on to the national news, but at the same time, there was an entire wave of, it was possible for the first time for the everyday person, now you don't even think about it, it's on your phone, but at the time, people, everyday people could, they often couldn't afford their own video cameras. They'd have to go to a place like Hallwells or Squeaky Wheel to get a video camera. That is incredibly different from right now when, um, you know, someone, the latest person to get beaten up or killed by the cops is documented by, you know, five people with their cell phones. This was the era in which <clears throat> media activism basically was born. And there was, I, I have this, um, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of the Deep Dish TV slogan and I can't remember. I think it was, uh, don't, um, well, there was Abby Hoffman's Don't Blame the Media, Become the Media. And then Deep Dish had a similar thing. And um, that was a brand new concept to tell your own story using your own equipment, to not just be dependent on NBC, CBS, and ABC, but to create cable access, to, to show uh, films at places like this, to project, I mean, the whole idea of projecting stuff on the sides of buildings during those slideshows, like, you wouldn't think of that now because, like, you could just do that, you know, at your own home, so. Mm -hmm. Charles. Hey, um First of all, you know, great accolades to all of you. Thank you for coming. Thanks to all of us. Um, made me remember the days and being in New York with Ellen Spiro and William and filming with her, making a squeaky wheel or, or David R. Aid's video, Ron, remember? Um, Meg Knowles' medical, Medicaid milkshake murder video, protesting like cake in the rain, I don't even remember. But to just actually now remember is just really um, affirming, and um, I just want to thank you all for, for bringing me back on here. I mean, it's what's not mentioned. Not, and I don't mean it to be sentimental. I just mean like you do for people do forget because our lives move on, and that, that's it. You know, uh, as as the impetus of, of of this film, what's not mentioned is in 1988. The, the UN had an International AIDS Awareness Day. And no notice. Right. 1989, for the second International AIDS Awareness Day, which is, later on can be rebranded as World AIDS Day, there was Day Without Art. 90% of, of the national and international media were cultural institutions and <coughs> artists' activities that were that gathered all the media attention. That's right. And it put another story, a, a set of images out there that just just wasn't a set of statistics. <coughs> um, so the ability of art, the, you know, art may, one may choose to, to believe that art has the, the um, responsibility to create change, to create change. This group of people who are represented there were in various 
art fields creating, attempting to create change. One might also argue that perhaps the Red Ribbon, the Ribbon Project, was the first viral art project. Because the minute Jeremy, as a personal favor to me, walked out wearing, no, it's true. My, my boyfriend was the company manager of the real thing and, were, and was a general manager for Manny Eisenberg, uh, which is how the Broadway community became involved in the project. Um, the minute that happened, the conversation went, na went national and international. Over the five years that I worked on the Red Ribbon, you know, it was one of our projects, so the Red Ribbon Project, I would say Visual Aid spent a whole of somewhere between eight and $10,000. Teach that at, at a graduate business school on marketing. <laughs> <laughs> that ACT UP uh, was perhaps the last comprehensive attempt at uh, uh, an analysis along the lines of race and class together with queerness, right? And we don't have that anymore. Now we have gay respectability, right, in terms of a comprehensive approach to analysis. So I guess uh, my question is not, not for filmmakers, uh, but uh, more for <laughs> the witnesses, uh, how we didn't get to see so much of that in the film, so that's what I'm asking. You know, how how did that happen at the time, and you understand why that is not happening on the level of national movements anymore? I'm not sure I understand what you actually said because of the uh, of the, 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 dis the, the distance here. Um, what, is, what is it that you're asking? What is your observation and then what are you asking yeah, so about my uh, experience? My, my, my understanding and uh, based on, you know, what, uh, the, the reading I've done about ECTOP is that that was perhaps the, the last comprehensive, large attempt on, on the level of, of a gay movement, right? There, the, there was an attempt at you know, like a political analysis that included race and class together with queer identity, right? And we arguably don't have that today, which is why I said we have gay respectability today as, as part of national agenda, right? So uh, I wonder what, uh, what your comment would be, how the situation the time of age crisis precipitated that, and how is that not centered today? Well, I, I don't. I don't agree that uh, ACT UP was the last of anything. I think ACT UP was something that happened in a chain. It wasn't the first of anything. It wasn't the last. It was a link in a chain that is an ongoing form of, um, of making those connections. And the very fact that you can ask the question means that the question is not gone. We are always asking it, um, or we should be, and if we're not, then we have to, <laughs> we have to push each other to do that. But uh, I think it happens all, all around us. I mean, ACT UP was a time in my life that those things came together in a very specific way, but I hear those questions asked, I mean, that's my Facebook feed is full of people making those connections all the time, so. I mean, the, ACT UP was about, they were single purpose, all right? Their purpose was to create a, a more proper response to what was becoming a pandemic. And to do it vocally, to do it in your face. They were also extremely conscious that unlike the government and the society's perception of, of AIDS, that it wasn't a gay illness. Um, 
So, and because sitting at the lesbian gays community center on West 13th Street, I had to listen to the English socialist mm. I do a complete analysis at every meeting of, the, of this issue, which I really doubted that the plastic surgeon over there and the advertising executive over here really wanted to share their hard-earned monies with. Um, they were very, yes, as a group, they were very aware of classism, but that was because we saw visually and we knew that AIDS didn't discriminate economically. Also the fact that probably most of the men in ACT UP were born into a white middle class family made them really um, shocked when they couldn't get something fixed the first time. I just happened to look like one of those men. I am not one of those men. Um, uh, yes, I was actually struggling to get out of the East Village my entire life. <laughs> Did it in a rather end, eventually snotty way, but never mind. Uh, but um, there I was, growing up on East 14th Street. Um, but the, uh, uh, in terms of the, what, are you asking about the gay assimilation and absorption by the, by the, the media? I don't know what the question about, so this is where I need you to help me. What's the question I can answer or observation I can make for you? Right. Uh, I'm, I'm talking, I guess, uh, about a certain lack of uh, understanding uh, in, you know, like professionalized gay activism of a certain lack of acknowledgement of that race and class play in what happens to you. Now? Which, no, then and, then. and no, now. Not today. Now, not, today? Not, not that. Uh, like I, now, today? But there's a big, yesterday. Mm. There's a big yeah. difference, it seems to me, because of the direct necessity <clears throat> of health intervention. And one of the things that came out of ACT UP meetings in the earliest days was that a bunch of middle class, college educated white people were presuming that their structure of identity was the same as was operative in, uh, say, an African American community. And what we found was that that was not the case, right? So the necessity of, of health intervention enforced a recognition of different cultures and different needs in those cultures, which was for many of us new. Um, and I think the other major uh, sort of distinction was also we recognized, because nobody was, you know, we, we were, you know, as, as everybody said, empowered generally, and yet we weren't making any shift in culture. Nobody was paying attention. And so we realized that the, the only way forward was alliance building. And there was an intense effort at alliance building. Yeah. Well, I would also just say that I don't think what you're saying about right now is really true. I think that's the depiction that the mainstream media puts forward. But certainly, if you go to a national uh, the Creating Change Conference of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, it's all about anti-racism work. And there's tons of lesbians involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think we need to take care about not generalizing about the, what's going on in LGBTQ communities based on a narrow lens. In the same way that ACT UP and sentient people questioned <laughs> what the media was telling us about AIDS. I think the same thing is true of uh, queer identity right now. Um, and that is also very different than, than the ACT UP eras that you really can see. Well, I mean, there are just a lot more sources, of info, too many sources of information, but there's lots of other channels. The two things I wanted to say, I hope I can remember both of them, about this are, First, and Patrick kind of uh, alluded to this in terms of ACT UP New York, but ACT UP Western New York, and I would assume other organizations around the country, I mean, there were lots of little ACT UPs all over the place, um, 
we've made it clear we were not a gay organization it was not about uh it was about a i can say it was a single issue thing it was about aids queer nation and uh, the lesbian avengers you know grew out in a way of act up but it wasn't really uh i mean yes there were a lot of uh, uh gay white men and gay men of color in the organization but there were also straight guys bisexuals um it was a ra there was a range of people we were really trying to keep the focus on fighting hiv and then, like I say, a queer movement kind of like, you know, evolved out of that. And the other thing that I wanted to point out is these issues about race and class and, uh, and queerness, these were ugly, difficult struggles. There was like this huge schism in the act of Western New York. It almost fell completely apart when it became really clear that there was like just, just because you're a gay guy doesn't mean that you're either A, uh, are not a misogynist or B are not a racist. And the organization went through hell at an early period in its life because uh, it was horrible. I mean, like it's, it sounds nice now that like we've got every, you know, we, we, this was the last, uh, you know, great blossoming of this thing. But I, those, those questions were ugly then and they're ugly now. There was all this discussion about mainstreaming and gay streaming was a briefly used term. Um, I'm having like flashbacks right now of horrible meetings where um, people would go, one white guy after another would say, well, I'm not a racist, but blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, it was awful and it was complicated and it's always complicated because we're people and people are complicated. <laughs> I just want to ask, Ron, was there also a corollary, um, because I, I, at this moment, I was in uh, Act Up San Francisco, mm. and that was my sort of term mm -hmm. at that moment, and one of the things that we were always dealing with was the question of whether the single <coughs> focus on AIDS um, was, in fact, feasible, possible, given the fact that so many of the social and political re rationales that animated AIDS phobia were related to homophobia were related to racism, et cetera. So then we would have these big debates about whether we could in fact be issue focused when right, yes. the issue was much broader. You're asking this to the guy who started an offset called uh, Radical Action Against AIDS and War because <laughs> the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, um, was happening at exactly the same time as the formation of ACT UP Western New York and I was all about, and I was not alone in this, there were many of us that were all about making connections between things. That's how those connections between race and class and gender um, came up was, uh, yeah, exactly that debate that it was huge. I mean, I was going to, oh, so you were in ACT UP uh, Golden, <laughs> there was ACT UP Golden Gate, ACT UP this, right, ACT UP right. that, there were... I was in the non-crazy uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the I think we'll be the judge at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let the record show. <laughs> and also, we had a, a great habit of creating action committees that then became their own group. Yes. Right. Unless the Avengers. The uh, uh, or in New York Housing Works. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the affinity groups Whack. were so mm -hmm. many at yeah. the point that Richard Elvich was, there were so many affinity groups that yes. you, you know, you, it might be an affinity group of one. And yes. That was kind of how they did that. So, right, right. so many groups focused on different things. And in New York, you know, which we did not do in the film, the, the problem with, with uh, needles and addicts was, was, was very controversial and entrenched within the response as well. The organization itself, you mean? The organization yeah. and what was happening with people and the, the, the political response in New York. And that, that's a whole messy subject there too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a homophobia working against, you know, care about, against the system caring about gay people, and then you had the war on drugs working against, you know, needle right. exchange as a response. And right. all kinds of uh, things like that that had to be. I mean, you know, it was, it's just wonderful to be, first of all, to be. Tr truly branded as a disposable group because, you know, AIDS became a gay disease. So we don't have to worry about it because it's only queers. Then, oh look, there's a second group, they're IV drug users. So, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> then they go. Then we learn something about some Haitians, maybe, maybe not. Yes. So the third group, but 
you might notice that everyone, everyone is actually kind of ghettoized and also dismissed. So what was was all of us, all these other actions, these positive things that we were trying to do was to combat that because we knew we needed help. I'm, I'm kind of interested, and I didn't get a chance the other night, since we're talking about AIDS actions and artwork about AIDS, other than myself, is there anybody living in this, sitting in this room who's living with AIDS who would care to tell me that? I, am not, I know I'm not the only person in America who has AIDS. You know, you know, I, I mean, I know it, even though the media tells me I'm that, because mm. apparently I have the ability to unring the bell, even though mm. I've been really sick since the 80s. Um, you, you know, there's an immediacy that was shared by everyone who you see in the film. There was an immediacy. This wasn't something to be pondered. It was their life, their boyfriend's life, their friends' lives that were on the stake da uh, at stake daily at that point in time. I think that the filmmakers did an incredible job of trying to recreate what we were feeling, not just what we did, but the reality of how we lived. Um, Jonathan would probably know this. Oh, in my personal experience, I felt as if an entire art community was disappearing overnight. Not just the richness of it, but geographically. <laughs> overnight, the East Village went from a thriving, a thriving arts community, I wouldn't say a thriving general community, but um, it disappeared. It felt like it was disappearing. Penny talks about it in the film. You could really feel like you were going crazy. That, you spent your days um, visiting somebody in the hospital, then going to Redden's, which was the only funeral home in Manhattan that would deal with AIDS, the bodies of the people who had died from AIDS at that point, getting home, and then there's something here that some people wouldn't even know existed, something called an answering machine, and you get the answering machine would be filled with a message of somebody flipping out because they were told they had AIDS. And, like, and all around that, you're trying to make your, to go to work, you're trying to do whatever it is that is supposed to be also defining you. And you just, this went on. This was a daily experience, not just for those like myself or the others who you, See in the, I'm to keep pointing at an empty screen. Sorry, <laughs> uh, you saw in the in the film, but it was a shared experience. <laughs> and it wasn't just the the desperately sick people; it was their caregivers who were walking zombies, for for which and and were we felt that way for a long time as it was going on that we were living in a war zone. And I could not turn on the, any, I didn't see it in the newspapers, I didn't see it in the news. That something this big was going on, but except it was bizarro world. And, you know, somewhere else it wasn't going on. And so um, that's the impetus for why any of us did something.